this on. Well, hello everybody. Um, I first have to confess I have um, my new Afghan champions here, and I re I'm referring to the young Afghan girls. I'm talking about education and the story of uh, that young girl who talked about um, how skateboarding changed her life. And um, I hope that there will be many more of these Afghan champions um, in the next generation to come, because we need them. I've been asked to talk about architecture and culture. This was the suggestion of um, the topic for my presentation. And I wasn't sure if it's not the other way around in Afghanistan. Um, it's the culture of architecture that, that may bring a change. And as an architect, I naturally tend to think of creating space, creating identity, and creating a culture. Is that better now? And the big question to me is, and probably to many people as well, is, is what, um, what does conflict bring to the identity, creating space, and the culture? And Afghanistan has developed its own history, developed its own history, a language, architectural language. People in the north, south, east, and west have developed their own architectural response to what was the main objective of bringing a balance between man's needs and climate. And this balance has been completely overthrown in the past uh, decades uh, because of conflict. And the conflict I'm talking about resulted in destruction and, and war, as you all know, and where destruction rules, nothing can grow and nothing can prosper. And that's quite a thing to work with in the first place. I think these are parameters uh, uh, that everybody uh, keeps asking, how can an, uh, an identity or culture stay alive and remain intact in such an environment? Uh, unfortunately, Afghanistan has seen a lot of ignorance and violence and is at risk of continuous conflict. And um, the next question for me is what can be passed on to the next, presentation, the, the next generation and the next um, people to come? And uh, even that's a matter for the present um, uh, generation. And we've seen some of the young uh, speakers here today, and I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed, and I have a lot of hope for them. But there are also possibilities through architecture um, to show and tell stories of the past. Uh, the question is, if these buildings no longer exist in a country like Afghanistan, then how, how are you going to tell stories? And there are many, many stories behind the building. Uh, that a lot of people can't see, they only see the, the finished product. But there are, the moment you create architecture, there are many uh, stories, there are many details that unfold. And today in Kabul, if you look around in the city, you see a lot of wealthy Afghans being able to build their own houses. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, this in particular, but what is interesting is that um, what was mentioned early before in the education, that even in architecture, you can see the sort of copy and paste techniques. And I can fully understand that as an architect, because architecture needs time, and we don't have time in Afghanistan. Conflict did not allow um, Afghans to express themselves and show their own identities. So now, the quicker we can show and express in architecture and buildings in, in places like Kabul who we are and what our identity is, that's the best thing people think they can do. So naturally, they, they look at uh, ready uh, products, they look at ready designs and uh, copy and paste them. Now what has resulted in post 9-11 architecture and, and urban trends which are not just ugly and unlivable, and I'm talking about the fortress-like architecture and, um, and also the narco palaces the, of the Nouveau Riche that I'm sure a lot of you people have come across. Um, what it all causes and, and what is most concerning to me as an architect is that uh, these sort of urban trends do not just create ugly spaces and, and unlivable spaces in a city. But the biggest concern to me is that it actually represents a disconnection of the people from history and time. And Afghans have always uh, created a very strong connection to history and time. They're very proud of it. Once architecture is created, um, as I said earlier, it can tell many, many stories. And um, it may last forever. Um, it may disappear because of conflict. And I wanted to invite you today with my presentation to um, a short but and brief journey through one of the most extraordinary countries where its culture stays alive because of its unique people. And as I'm standing here today, I'm, I'm pretty confident that this culture uh, will survive in Afghanistan despite conflict and, and, uh, and destruction. 
the image that you can see here, um, a photography taken by um, James Nachtway, that was the image that brought me back to Afghanistan about seven years ago. And it's again an image of destruction in the city of Kabul. And as a young architect back then, I thought, okay, you know, you can fix the city, you can fix the buildings, so surely it's an easy thing to fix society. And it took me many, many years to realize that this simple calculation does not work in a place like Afghanistan. If it works in other places, probably not. The interesting thing for me was that um, the Afghan people have created, of course, out of necessity, but also because of their strong ties to their own cultural identity, they've created their own space. They have not thought about architects immediately. They've created their own space, and, and that was the thing that was the most um, striking element to see with the Afghans, that they, they have this wish to continue and, and, and create their own identity. And they have to uh, base these decisions um, on their daily struggles, and the daily struggles that probably most of us have never faced before or never, uh, will never face. And so it's, it's unimaginable for us to, um, to think and put ourselves in Afghan shoes. After destruction uh, follows the survival instinct that kinks, kicks in. And I was looking in 2006 at a research project um, where Afghans returned to Kabul, an overpopulated city, or then st starting to grow and becoming overpopulated, and looking at um, Afghans who want to restart a peaceful life, um, and also uh, Afghans who, who are beyond uh, the immediate need of survival. So people who want to build houses and, and, and look into houses that actually can help them to come back to a normal life. And of course you can see Kabul, even today it's overcrowded, we have way too many people here living in the city and there are no plans to help um, bring people um, you know, and provide accommodation to them. And uh, you probably know that most Afghans prefer the traditional courtyard house and I looked at one specific uh, building type with that research that was not the courtyard house, um, it was actually the houses on the hillsides in Kabul that everybody, of, everybody knows. The interesting thing with that um, building typology was actually that um, uh, Afghans have actually returned to Kabul and they have spent a significant amount of money to build these houses on the hillsides because they could not afford to, land, to live in the city. And an estimate in 2006 um, looked at the, the money spent um, from these Afghans and estimated the investment at around 1.3 billion US dollar. Uh, by 2006, the Afghans have spent on houses on hillside settlements, which represents uh, roughly a 12% of the building typology or the building stock back then in 2006. Um, so I went to, the, to an Afghan family and um, spent about two weeks, just two weeks, I didn't have more time unfortunately, with them in one of those um, hillside houses. Um, it's one of the many, many stories that you have heard before. Uh, a mother with no husband who died uh, during the war, many, many children, and despite these sort of so social circumstances, uh, what was extraordinary that they had managed to build a house for themselves and they had managed to um, get into a daily routine with their activities. So, not suggesting how they should live and how to build their houses, because Afghans know how to build houses, but looking at improved techniques and how this can basically help them to um, have a better life. So one of the things, obviously, while doing the research was looking at the, the customs and the traditions in Afghanistan and looking also at the vernacular language that you can find all over in Afghanistan, but it seems that everybody has ignored and forgotten about it. So one of the big, um, one of the things that I looked at was um, how the roof space can be utilized, for example. And this is just one of the things that I looked at uh, at this research. Because the female residents use the roof, for example, in those hillside settlements as an extended workspace. It's a replacement for a courtyard that they don't have because they don't have enough space up in the hills. So the idea was basically um, to develop a sort of a tent structure uh, that can be made out of local materials, um, an adaptive tent structure that can respond to the various climatic conditions, something that the Afghans managed very well over decades and, and centuries. But it seems like this sort of uh, philosophy has, has gotten sort of disappeared. And the interesting thing for me was actually to look then at uh, simulations for the roof in a scientific way and, and looking how this can actually improve and not just become a, a gimmick for residents, but something that has real, a real application and, and may change their sort of daily activities. 
Um, the graphs that you can see here, they, they just demonstrate um, how, for example, the, the surface temperature, and it's, I'm sorry to say this is a bit more technical, but the surface temperature of a building can be reduced with a, a tent structure or with a shading device in summer on a typical hot day from 70 degrees Celsius down to 30 degrees Celsius. So th there's, a, there's a real application to it. But we also looked at um, um, other things, for example, insulation, because that's one of the key things that's missing in Afghanistan and that seems to be sort of nobody cares about it. Uh, and for the people who spent um, the seasons in Afghanistan and Kabul, they know how cold it gets in winter. So we sort of rediscovered the Afghan sheep and we looked at using sheep wool as um, an insulating material, looked at the uh, materials which are available on the Afghan market and we combined and developed the so-called sheep wool insulation bags. Um, which I hope that um, there's a real application for it. We're still working on, on some of the details, and, and hopefully one day we can equip the houses in Kabul with um, this sort of insulating bags, which can um, really improve the thermal comfort of people here. And, you know, um, stepping away from people who can actually afford uh, heating their homes, there are lots of people in Kabul and Afghanistan who can actually not afford heating their homes. And um, the past two, three winters were pretty harsh in Afghanistan and it's caused a lot of people to, to die, basically. The results of this research, they were put together and I was thinking about how, how can this actually be reached out and how can this be presented to the Afghans. And um, I decided then to put it together in a sort of manual that um, uh, shows the various con construction techniques and um, using local materials in a way that it's sort of familiar to the Afghans, they can work with it. It's sort of a step-by-step -step manual for them to understand um, how they can improve their, their homes. And the suggestions were not strict guidelines for them. The idea is to give these handbooks out to the Afghans um, who know best for themselves what they need and what they can afford at, um, at a, certain, uh, a certain, certain time. And the... Um, it's, it's totally up to them to take this handbook and further develop and hopefully, to me as an architect, I see this as just a sort of creating a platform where to let the, the people decide what they want to do and how they want to continue. When I had a chance to return to Kabul, it didn't take me a second thought to do so and that was in, in, in late 2006 and um, I was totally ready as an architect to uh, forget about what I had learned before and experienced in other countries and I thought, as an architect, there's so many great things you can do in a, in a society that suffered so much from conflict. And um, fortunately, I had a chance to come back and, and work in the old city and working on some of the most extraordinary buildings and traditional buildings that can be found in Afghanistan. And again, it's an image of destruction. It's an image of uh, complete abandonment. It's an image of um, or the result of conflict. And... Um, the images, I think, they speak for themselves that the once so vibrant and, and vivid uh, traditional quarters of Kabul, they were suddenly abandoned. And for me, there was, there was a, a moment of pain to see, uh, especially because of our own family has a connection to the old city. And um, that was quite um, devastating to see what has happened actually to uh, these traditional quarters. Um, at the same time, there were many, many problems there. There were these uh, traditional neighborhoods, they were ignored and neglected for many, many, many years. Garbage accumulated there. There were meters and meters of garbage covering walkways, even houses to a certain extent. And the first thing was actually to remove these sort of layers that uh, were built up over, over, over years and decades. And I realized at the same time that conflict also means, again, disconnection. And it disconnects people from its own place, from their own place, from their own roots. Um, but what I realized as well later on working in the old city that there was still something very charming about the old city, despite the destruction, despite the building and the poverty you would see there. And it's simply because of the community. It's simply because of the people who still live there and simply because of the generation um, and the parents' generation who decided not to move on, maybe because of economic reason, but also because of the reason that it's their place. They belong to this place, and they're going to stay there, and if it takes them to die there, they're going to die there. So looking at, at the energy that comes with the community, it was something that I, I said, we got to hurry up, we got to develop these plans in the old city to sort of showcase that we can get, can back, um, can get back to a normal life. And as an architect, it was not really 
uh, a project where you would say, oh great, you're gonna design your ideas and you, you know, sketch and draw and this and that. It was a completely different experience, a different approach because we worked with the local community. We had to, and we wanted to, and we worked with the Afghan carpenters and the Afghan masons, um, and even to the extent that we had skilled and unskilled labor there. So for an architect, it was a complete different experience to look at and forgetting about all the tools that you use or have learned in, in architectural school. And the results were quite striking. I think if you have a chance, please do and go and visit the, the old city. It's worthwhile it. So coming back to architecture, what I said earlier, there are so many stories behind the building. Um, this is a quite an important project to me because there are so many possibilities for the Afghans and for this current generation that maybe had not, did not have the chance to, to learn from books or to learn uh, from their parents or to see it themselves. These are places they can actually go and feel and touch and sense the place. And um, I very much hope that they, they all have a chance to, to learn more about the history and the place, uh, Afghanistan. The next project, moving away from these sort of traditional houses which are more dealing with private houses and a lot of people have no access to these private houses. Um, the next project is sort of a, a demonstration um, of our practice here in Kabul where we uh, deal with the public and, 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 and see how the public interacts with public space. And the big question for us was um, how, would a, um, how would people who only experienced conflict, how would they react and what would they expect to happen in a public space? And the, the building where we are sitting in here today is part of, of one or what used to be one of the most advanced school complexes and schools in, in Afghanistan and it's a, it's a showcase of the strong commitment for culture and education between two countries, Afghanistan and, and France. And uh, its foundation was laid in the 1960s or late 1960s by no other but uh, Georges Pompidou. So it's, it's a quite symbolic uh, building for both of the countries. Um, but what happened is over, over years of, of conflict, this building, the space was no longer used in its original function. And you see images there of, of what the space used, used to look like. I think some of you remember the auditorium that looked slightly different. And um, in 2008, it was decided to reopen the institute. And we've been asked to create a space here, which I'll talk about it a little bit later. But the, the interesting thing is since the opening in 2009, and I have to say one thing here that the rehabilitation work of this complex um, covered about nine months, and um, I still blame the French for it, that I, I, I suffered three months after the opening and had three months to recover from this intense nine months of, of work here at this building, but it was a worthwhile effort. And the task was for us to create a space that um, enables artists, but also the Afghan audience, but also the foreign community to come together. Uh, they are invited uh, for a much needed cultural dialogue. And uh, we have seen many, many great events since the opening in 2009 here at the Cultural Institute. And I have to say, I should have listened uh, to some other people. The stage is pretty big here, I have to say. We are pretty close to the audience. So the stage was originally in this, probably at this uh, line here. But nonetheless, I think um, it's difficult for us to say if the space works or not. And um, I hope that it works actually for the artists here to uh, show their, uh, their art, show their ideas, demonstrate that they have um, a word to say as well. And um, in the past three years, we have not received any complaints from the client regarding the space. The most striking memory I have actually of this work here was exactly in the same place in this auditorium. And you can see an image there where for the very first time uh, Afghan girls and Afghan boys sat together, the girls on this side and the boys on, on the other side. And the reason why they came together because the first event here in this auditorium after the opening ceremony was to show a French movie. And I thought this was absolutely amazing because it, it brought these young boys and girls together in a sort of normal environment. And I realized only then when some of the teachers who've been at the school for many, many years and decades in teaching here, they started crying and they were touched by it. And I, when I asked them, like, what happened? Is anything wrong? Are you not happy with the light or what's happened? They actually said, no, it rem reminded them of the good old days here in Kabul that they themselves experienced. And this generation that sat here, they don't have these memories of the good old days in Kabul. And I think with that image, um, I'm going to close my uh, presentation and 
to close the circle of what has architecture to do with conflict and, and culture, um, I think potentially a lot because it's a subtle way of bringing peacefully people together, healing their wounds in a, in, without talking about the painful details. And uh, you've seen the presentations today, um, even the presentation right now before me, they, these are pretty intense and they are, they are difficult to digest and difficult to put in the right place and give perspective. Recently read an article on China where uh, China struggles with its own cultural identity and uh, simply because of the modern development that took, uh, took place and still takes place in the country. And there's no comparison between Afghanistan and China at this place, but the interesting notion of this article was that China is now in a brave new world investing in, in new national champions. And I thought to myself when I read the article, we have so many uh, national champions in Afghanistan, but they're unheard, they're unseen, and nobody really gives them a chance. And I hope that in the next years to come, especially uh, towards post-2014, the Afghan community and the international community will not abandon the Afghans again and will give the, uh, the young generation specifically and these Afghan champions that we've seen today here really give them a chance to bring peace and stability back to this country. And I'm very much looking forward to meeting these Afghan champions and, and meeting them today and talk about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.